You may remember that I set a goal for myself to not buy books for the first three months of the year. <laughs> what do you think happened? Hello, bibliophiles. Today you're witnessing my shame. My shame and my inability to not purchase books. And um, just to clarify, I don't actually really feel shame. I feel a little bit of shame. Um, but mostly I feel like I knew I couldn't do it and I don't know why I set myself the goal. Well, it's good to set yourself goals, but anyway, I'm not surprised I didn't stick with it. Here are all the books that I bought during my book buying ban. <laughs> I'm gonna start off talking about the books I got from Perfect Books, my local bookstore that I talk about all the time. I love them so much. Um, I will link them down below. They're just like, you know, they're very, very close to where I live so I can easily pop over on my lunchtime. They always affirm my book choices. I know that they're a bookseller um, and they want to sell books, but they also make me feel good about what I've chosen. <laughs> so I feel like it's a really good relationship we have going. Anyway, um, I one thing I really, really appreciate about their website is that they um, put little maple leaves alongside Canadian titles, Canadian publishers, and I find that um, really helpful when I'm trying to find new stuff. The other thing is that they um, they have such diversity of Canadian books, like really small publishing houses, uh, books I had never heard of, books that are not getting like nominated for prizes or anything. So I really appreciate that. So I have some of those in here. So let's just start from the top of the pile because they're piled uh, precariously on a chair next to me. The first one I've already talked about because I have started reading it. I'm only like two chapters in, but this is A Place for Everything, The Curious History of Alphabetical Order by Judith Flanders. Just how, how gorgeous that cover is. I spied this when I was uh, doing a quick browse with my friend Jen when we, I hadn't been to a bookstore in person in a couple of months. Um, not that that stopped me from buying books online, <laughs> but um, I hadn't been in person. I saw this and I just, I mean, the cover is so beautiful. And for those of you who may not, I probably haven't talked about this very much, but I am obsessive about organizing my shelves by alphabetical order. It's something I, I really, really care about. So I have already started reading this and um, I read the first chapter and I was like, this is a very, very niche book, <laughs> but I'm uh, very, very interested in it. Um, it's, it's also, if you're interested in linguistics, I think you might also find this interesting. There's a lot in the first chapter, at least about um, language and how it evolved uh, in a writing form, not so much in a spoken form, but anyway, I'm really enjoying this so far. I've only read a chapter, but I suspect, um, this will be one I'll kind of pick away at for a little while because it's it's a little bit dense, but it is very, very interesting. I also bought another Hefty Beast. This is um, Louise Gluck's Poems, 1962 to 2012. This is like, this was like kind of everywhere after she won the Nobel Prize. I picked this up because uh, I I just had been feeling like I wanted to read some poetry. And for some reason, I, I just had my mind set on like I wanted this collection of poetry. I haven't started it yet. Um, I did read the first poem and um, I have no particular feelings about it. Um, but there's a lot of poetry in here. Like it's this is like a 500 page poetry book and usually poetry books are quite short. So this is obviously a very huge <laughs> canon to pull from. So uh, we'll hopefully be picking up this um, in the in the spring summer months. I feel like this is a spring book. I don't know. I don't know anything about poetry, but that's how I'm interpreting this. This is the book that I wanted to show you that um, I just found by browsing the website and I thought, I need this book. So this is You Are Eating an Orange, You Are Naked, a novel by Shung King. So this is, <laughs> I'd never heard of, this is published by Book Hug Press, which are, I think they're, I think they're based in Montreal, but I could be wrong about that. Um, but they are a small press in uh, Canada. And when I was reading the little blurb, uh, it says, a young translator travels from his home in Toronto to Hong Kong, Macau, Prague, Tokyo. His unnamed lover comes with him. In restaurants and hotel rooms, they entertain each other with comic and enigmatic folktales. Yet their verbal play and philosophical questions mask the fragility of their own relationship, which is made still more tenuous by the woman's unexplained disappearances. Um, <laughs> it just sounds so strange and the cover and the title is so appealing and so kind of, it just so, it's not shocking, but it's definitely like, striking you notice this kind of title um and it says here that this is like has surrealism of haruki murakami and this made me think of when i read after dark which i loved so much um considering i mean i've had a very mixed relationship with haruki murakami which i will talk about maybe some other time but um i loved after dark one of my favorite books i read uh that year when i read it and so i read the first couple pages of this and it definitely has that kind of 
surrealism, a bit of, of like what like kind of what is going on type of thing, but also you're enjoying it. So I as soon as I finish what I'm currently reading, I will definitely be getting to this because I just feel so um intrigued and curious about this book. And this is why I'm saying, like, I love that they have the little maple leaf. I just think it's great. This is another one of those books that I came just came across while I was browsing that um, is published by Canadian publisher Coach House Books. This is The Dark Library by Cyril Martinez, translated by Joseph Patrick Stansel. And this is translated from the French. Um, I don't know if the author or translator are Canadian, but it is published by a Canadian, um, a Canadian press. And that is very exciting. So this is... It, this is what it says in the back. Libraries are magical places, but what if they're even more magical than we know? In Cyril Martinez's library, the books are alive. Not just their ideas or their stories, but the books themselves, etc. And I, this is a, just a short book, but I loved the cover so much. And I just thought, oh, this is something I've never heard of. No one's ever talked about it. I'm going to pick it up. Again, just love the little things you find. That's the one thing that's truly wonderful about browsing in store that browsing online doesn't really give you is the kind of freedom to be like, what's this random little book? I'm going to pick that up. Speaking of random little book, <laughs> this is The Great Cat Massacre and Other Episodes in French Cultural History by Robert Darnton. Uh, this is something I found when I was browsing just the bookstore and I thought, obviously, I need this. The Great Cat Massacre. I think there's 10 stories in here about um, kind of f strange things that have happened in uh, in or six things. Yeah, so six things um, that have happened uh, in French cultural history. And uh, I, don't, I don't know a lot about French history, but this just sounded like, I clearly have to read this. I mean, look at the cat on this cover. She's going through something. I obviously had to have it. I also haven't read any of these, by the way. Um, my reading to buying ratio is low. Um, then I was kind of in the mood for, I feel like I've been trying to branch out a little bit this year and what I've been picking up and I'm interested in. Partially I think that's because I, you know, just trying to find something exciting and different in my life because of, you know, one year into this nonsense. Um, so I picked up The Fifth Season, season by N.K. Jemisin as well from Perfect Books. Uh, this is something that I have wanted to pick up some N.K. Jemisin for a little while since last year and I just wasn't really sure which one to get. And then I thought, let's just start with one of her Hugo Award winners. And this is the one that they had at the bookstore and I was like, you know what? Great. I keep seeing it everywhere. Um, these are hefty boys. Like she's a... I mean, the, the font is pretty big, but still, these are like, oh, look how floppy. Very satisfying. So yeah, I'm gonna, um, this is the Broken Earth trilogy, right? So I'm gonna try to give this a go. Um, in addition to picking up that, I did pick up the Best American Science Fiction Fantasy of 2020, um, by, edited by, uh, Diana G Gabaldon? Oh my gosh, how do you say her name? Gabaldon? Oh my gosh. You know, the one who wrote Outlander. <laughs> um, why did I pick this up? Great question. I know that uh, Sabrina from Bookish, Sabrina, she frequently reads um, science fiction anthologies and to kind of try to find new authors. And I thought, that's a great idea. What if I just picked up, you know, I read a couple of short stories or some whatever uh, types of writing are in here. That might be a good way for me to figure out some new authors or some new kind of styles of writing that I like. And uh, you know what? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Nothing matters. Nothing matters. Let's talk about Shakespeare. <laughs> Rachel, who I follow on Twitter and I've been chatting with over the past year or so, she and a bunch of other people who make videos, Books and Bow and Jennifer and um, there's lots of other people too, but they do Project Shakespeare and where they every two weeks they perform a play on Zoom, which is like something I never thought I'd want to be part of. And I don't know if I want to be part of it, but I definitely super admire their commitment and their idea. I think it's like just a really fun thing to have done for a year and they're still doing it. So inspired by her frequent posts about reading Shakespeare, I decided I would read some Shakespeare. Um, I, <laughs> you will know that I don't really like, I've talked before, I don't really like reading Shakespeare, but then I wondered if maybe if I read it, um, if I read some of his plays, cause I've read all of his comedies and a few of the tragedies and none of the histories. Um, so I figured maybe if I um, started reading some of the plays uh, and talking about people, with, talking about them with people who love them and who have acted them, um, maybe that would kind of like, I think it's a good thing to like, to engage with them. All that is to say, I bought three Shakespeare plays. <laughs> so I bought, I wanted to go with these Oxford editions. I think I like that they have, um, 
uh, pictures and they have like lots of notes in them. Hold on. So they have like, you have notes on the bottom of the, of the text. So notes on history, but also on the language and the performances and stuff. And um, some of the words are defined. So I really like these additions. So I picked up The Comedy of Errors, which I believe was Shakespeare's first play. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and this is about twins. Shakespeare has an obsession with twins. As a twin, I like twin things. Um, part of my undergraduate thesis was a little bit inspired by this play. So I picked up this. I have read it. From what I remember, it's very easy to read. So I figured I would give that another go as an easy play. Um, but really, I wanted to read Hamnet. I've never... Hamlet. Wow, Hamnet. Look at me thinking about Maggie O'Farrell. Hamlet. Um, I have never read this play. And uh, I know... It's amazing how little I know about Hamlet, <laughs> considering it is the play. First of all, let me just also clarify that you can read whatever you want to read. You don't have to read anything specifically. But I find a lot of pleasure from reading deeply in the sense of understanding the canon. The canon. Oh, I'm so sorry for using that language. We all know the canon is malleable, but I, I, <laughs> I find pleasure in reading understanding the history behind uh, different other stories like they're being published now and how they reference previous texts. And there's so many books and stories and, and movies and television shows that reference Hamlet in some way. And I don't know Hamlet. So I think um, that will just make my experience of consuming that stuff much richer. So I'm going to read Hamlet when, I don't know, at some point. And then, of course, I picked up Julius Caesar because I also haven't read Julius Caesar. And um, that also feels like a uh, an oversight that should be rectified um, in terms of, again, like the greater canon of literary history. Um, I also really like this cover. And uh, this is quite a short play from what I can see. This one's like, Hamlin is a, a juicy boy, but this one's quite thin. So will I read some Shakespeare? I mean, it remains to be seen. Um, some other books I picked up. I picked up Slouching Toward Bethlehem because this cover. So I wanted to, re I wanted to pick this up for a while. It's been on my like to buy list for a little while. And then I was looking on Amazon. I'm sorry, I bought a book from Amazon. I was looking on Amazon for, um, specifically for a French book, which I will tell you about in a second. Um, but then I saw this like kind of suggested to me because I had been browsing for it before. And this cover is just, it's stunning. I just love it. And uh, so I picked it up and I feel like, this bookmark I was looking for. Um, I haven't started reading yet, but I, uh, it's a collection of essays. I feel like everyone uh, talked about this book, has read this book, loves this book. Um, so I'm imagining that I will get to it relatively soon because um, I have wanted to read it for a little while. So the French books I was buying, um, the first is like a workbook. It's like the Becherel, the complete guide to conjugating, which is like, if you've um, ever studied French, or I think there's also one for Spanish, probably other languages. Basically, it's just like a, it's a verb guide about how to conjugate verbs and gives you some information about French. I'm learning French for my job. And um, my copy, I had a copy before. Like, I remember when I was in school and we were studying French, like, everyone had a Becherel. Um, mine is at my office. I haven't been to my office in a full year, a full year as of today. So um, I had to order a new one. In addition to that, <laughs> I bought a copy of Arsène Lupin. Gentlemen, cam cambrioleur. I can't pronounce that word. Um, this is by Maurice LeBlanc. And I bought this because I was watching the show Lupin at the beginning of the year. And it's, um, I didn't realize it was, it was in French until I was watching it. And uh, it's set in Paris. It's about, it's like the French version of Sherlock, only he's not a um, detective. He's a thief. And the heist nature of it, I love a good heist. And I loved the show so much. It was giving me so much joy that I figured, um, you know, the way that I've been trying to practice my French, as I said, and, you know, I I can write English well because I read a lot. So I figured uh, perhaps if I read some French, and this is a story that like children or like young readers would read. Uh, so it's not particularly like complex in its language. So it might be a perfect thing for me to read to practice my, my grammar. Friends, there's still more. I picked up Open House, A Life in 32 Moves by Jane Christmas. Jane Christmas, is she on my shelf somewhere here? She's on my shelf here somewhere. She is a Canadian uh, memoirist kind of. Her books have, uh, they're all nonfiction and they, um, are largely based around her life events and her different things she's done in her life. This is about her moving to a house in the UK with her husband, I believe. And she um, recoll she recollects her different moves she's made in her lifetime. Jane Christmas is an author that I feel like people sleep on. She is a great writer. She's funny. She's um, really observational. 
she has some like some nice insights about life generally and I really enjoy her writing so I figured this was something I like to kind of um, have her collection of her works and uh, I haven't read her books in a little while so I figured this is a new one time to pick it up and I think I will really really enjoy this also I really like that cover um, very satisfying so that's what I might go to in the near future because I feel like I'll read it very fast and it'll be really satisfying. Then I picked up The Cooking Gene, A Journey Through African American Culinary History in the Old South by Michael W. Twitty. And I had ordered this, I wanted to read it during um, February, during Black History Month. I wanted to read some nonfiction um, by a black author. And I really like food memoirs. And I think someone had suggested this to me on my Instagram. I think it was this one. But either way, it didn't arrive in time. <laughs> so I actually have already started reading this. I'm only like 15 pages in, but man, this is excellent. I'm going to love this book. My initial impression of this book is that it's a little bit wordy, but I still was reading it and just like feeling like I learned so much in 15 pages. So I think um, the first part of this book, and I don't know what it's like for the rest of the book, but he talks a lot about his uh, ancestry of um, the slaves that brought over initially and traces his own history back. And the very first like couple pages is a family tree. And the only thing I like more than a map is a family tree. So I loved that. And then he talks about um, working on uh, plantations, uh, like um, like reenactments of plantations where he cooks on them and talks about the food that they made on plantations. And that's the first 15 pages and I was completely hooked. I will say, let me tell you something I hate guys. I hate when a preface or an introduction to a book is like not page numbered. It's like has um, like Roman numerals. I hate that. This is my e-reader and I'm holding this up so I don't forget to tell you that I bought a copy on my e-reader of uh, the Bridgerton number one book, The Duke and I. And I wasn't gonna buy that book. Um, I don't really read romance as you know. And the show I had a lot of problems with. I mean, I loved it. I watched the whole thing, but like obviously there's like some issues with that show. But my friend, uh, Amy, had messaged me and she's like, this is exactly what I needed to read right now. She's like, it is just complete fluff for the brain. She's like, you have to read it, you really enjoy it. So I bought it to talk about it with her. Haven't read it yet? Of course I haven't. Um, then I picked up a copy of Beowulf, a new translation by Maria Dava Headley. Dava? Headley. I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> I was talking to someone about how um, I've never wanted to read Beowulf. This is the first first like English text it was written in Old English and then um, been translated over multiple times. But this is the first, trans a new translation that's by a woman. I think it's the first one by a woman. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I, I don't know why I decided that like maybe this is the only way I would, I, I would ever read Beowulf. And I also just like look at that cover. I mean, incredible. I had to do a history of Old English in my English degree, in my undergrad. And um, let me tell you, Old English is very hard. It's not English. It's like kind of German. Anyway, it's very difficult. Uh, so I'm glad I'm reading it in translation because I did have to translate some stuff from Old English to English. I mean, very small passages, but man, it was rough. Anyway, Beowulf. Um, and then I picked up this book, which is The Impossible State, North Korea, Past and Future by Victor Cha. Um, with a new epilogue. I don't know when this was originally published. Let me just do, ooh. So floppy, so enjoyable. Uh, this was originally published in 2012. I don't really know what it's about specifically. I assume it's about the inner workings of North Korea. Sometimes um, I just get in the mood to read stuff like that. Uh, I think everyone has an interest kind of in these, the unknowable things. And I, I have read a couple books in my lifetime on North Korea, not a whole lot, but this is one I thought, you know what, maybe, uh, maybe someday I'll be like, you know what, time to familiarize myself with North Korea. If you watch my last video where Olive and I did a book exchange, I read Jhumpa Lahiri's The Namesake, I picked up a copy of Unaccustomed Earth by Jhumpa Lahiri. Is this the one that was in translation? Let me see. No, it is not. I know that there was one that she wrote in another, was it Italian? And then was translated, is she translated herself or something? I don't know, but she's impressive. But um, I decided I loved the namesake and I figured, you know what, her writing is for me. So I found this for cheap and I picked it up. And then I have two more books here. Guys, we're at the end, two more books. I picked up um, Ask Again Yes by Mary Beth Keen. This is what I know was uh, in a book of the month box. That's where I kept seeing it was people had the book of the month copy and um, I wasn't interested in until, who was it? I heard talking about it. I think it was um, supposedly fun actually like a while ago, he said he read it and it was a story about a family and there was like, I think somebody gets shot by accident and these families are trying to work out how to deal with that together. And um, the way he described it, I just sounded like that's a book I will like. And uh, again, uh, The Tonight Show, Summer Reads. Oh God, I gotta tell you guys, I don't like Jimmy Fallon. 
So that does bump it down a bit for me. I, I do want to read this, so I, I mean, I'm glad I have it um, to crack into. And <laughs> the last book on this list is Maggie Brown and Others by Peter Orner. Let's talk about, first of all, this stunning cover. Like, is it feathers? Is it waves? Is it hair? It's just gorgeous. But I picked this up because, for two reasons, three reasons. One, I want to read it. <laughs> two, um, I want to do a video about like short story collections. And I realized that all of my short story collections are by Newfoundland slash Canadian women. And then I also realized that um, I would like to have more than that <laughs> as, as options. So I needed to buy more. I don't, because all the ones I have on my bookshelf are still by Newfoundlanders or Canadians. <laughs> so I figured um, let's uh, let's branch out a little bit. The other part of it um, was, I think it was Jen from Insert Literary Pun here, like maybe last year or the year before, like a long time ago, she read this and she raved about it. And I haven't stopped thinking about it since she raved about it because the cover is striking, but also um, she liked it so much that I just felt like, well, then I need to pick it up. I mean, Something about, you know how sometimes people talk about books and they just click with you and you're like, I need to read that? And that's how I feel about this book. So that is my book buying ban haul. <laughs> oh gosh. I mean, you know what? We do what we gotta do these days, don't we folks? I mean, it's been uh, it's been a journey. It's been a, it's been a, it's been a year and it's only March, whatever, mid-March. Please let me know um, what you want to see me read from this collection. Um, if there's something that you would like me to film, uh, maybe I could do a try a chapter tag for some of these. Maybe I could do, um, I don't know, maybe we could do a buddy read like as, as like a channel if you wanted to do that. I don't know, let me know. I'm open to all kinds of ideas because again, nothing matters. So thank you all. <laughs> that sounds really dark, but I just mean, you know, we're just waiting it out. We're waiting it out. We're riding out the rest of the year until we're all vaccinated and can all be hugging each other. But until then, I have all these books to read. So let me know what you want me to do with them. <laughs> As always, thank you so much for being here and I will see you guys soon. Bye.